Um, yeah, it's a great pleasure to first talk today in the afternoon is by chance. Uh, Theos Theodosopoulos, is that correct? Yeah, it's correct. Oh, really? How's it going? It's just chance. So, uh, thanks for coming. It's um, a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Yes, thank you for having me. I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Uh, as you can tell from my accent and from well, I'm from Greece originally, but I am from California, from the States, uh, for many years. Um, and I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank the people at uh, the Topos Institute that have been encouraging me uh, in my um, sort of pursuit of a learning category theory. I'm not a category theorist, I'm a protagonist and modeler by training for years. I've studied stochastic interaction models. Uh, but for the last few years, I've been trying to utilize category theory, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, so, um, I'll speak today about, let's see, hopefully, this one, I did something bad. Okay, I did something bad, never mind, I won't do this. Uh, I want to see the clicker, yeah. Just clicking it, like if you click into the window once. Uh, That's it. Yeah. Okay. Is that good? And now I, which one? Oh, the next one. Yeah. Okay, there we go. Okay, so, um, right, today I want to talk about two different models that I've worked with over the years. These are classes of models um, of uh, neural uh, dynamics. And um, a way to map one to the other using categorical ideas, and then how to use those to make some inferences about the behavior of these models, which could be interpreted as um, elements of uh, a conscious state, perhaps. <laughs> and uh, I, I was thinking, you know, how, how to describe this idea that um, of living essentially in a space of models, where you know, like myself professionally, I occupy myself. Uh, with building such models and studying behaviors, for example, by simulating them. Um, these models are um, you know, usually toy models of you know, more theoretical uh, interest than a connection to, uh, to real world data, although occasionally we do that as well. But um, the idea of transforming models, of, and category theory is sort of a, a, a theory of models or a model of models, uh, is, is what has been more in my mind. Uh, lately, and I happened to read a couple of weeks ago uh, the article by Jill Lepore, the, his, the historian uh, in the New Yorker, where um, it was about AI ostensibly, uh, something about you know, the, 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 the increasing uh, relevance of AI in our world, and and she came up with this metaphor that I thought really uh, you know, resonated with me. Uh, this metaphor of a chest of drawers. Uh, vertical chest of drawers, like in an office, where the top one, she says, are mysteries, and underneath that are facts. Below that are numbers, and the bottom one is data. And she went on to say that humanity started many you know, centuries ago. Primarily all the questions were with mysteries. Everything was a mystery. And I don't think there's a better example of a mystery than what is consciousness. That's a paradigmatic example, I think. Um, as science took off, especially in the age of enlightenment, we accumulated more facts. And I like to think of facts as the models with which I interact, the space where I live. Um, and by the way, she is very explicit, and, and, and so am I in this case. When I talk about facts, I mean made up things in the literal etymology. Stories that we make up to explain the world, to explain, to answer, let's say, the mysteries, right? Sometimes we use mathematics, sometimes we even use category theory. But basically we come up with some stories to tell. They are made up, they're not the world. And, um, and they make sense to us, to some degree. Then we have numbers, where we, well, one way to conceptualize that is we instantiate we, you know, the models. We come up with specific instances of things that are in the world. We measure things, you know, the things that can be measured. They don't owe us a reason for being so, they're not a story, they just are. And finally, we get to data, and that was the main thing in her mind, though for me it would play a little role. But um, to give it justice, I think the point is that data are not really comprehensible numbers in the traditional sense. They're not 
facts. They're not uh, in the sense of big stories that make sense to us that we make up. They are basically um, aggregates that can only be interpreted through artificial intelligence, essentially, and uh, you know feed us essentially other data or perhaps some numbers, um, some summary numbers. But they're not explainable. They don't. They don't intend to be explainable. But I see Bob coming back here, and he did make a claim, which I will open to at some point, uh, for making AI uh, interpretable. So, but. Be that as it may, my interest is in, this, in the second drawer, in the drawer of facts, conceived of as stories. So I'm going to talk to you about these toy models as, as basically you know, consistent types of stories that we can tell, that make sense to us, hopefully, about how our brain works. And they might be able to interact, and this is my interest in category theories, to what extent they, those stories, can interact with the mysteries that drive it, like what is consciousness, what kind of answer might we ever accept, accept as a possible answer to that, right? Like, and how can it interact with the rest of the stories that we tell about, you know, the facts, the facts in, uh, in science. So, specifically, uh, we'll return to it at the end. Okay, so, now I'm, I'm going to kind of demonstrate uh, in reverse what uh, one of the earlier speakers claimed, that category theories here to make things simpler, so I'm going to demonstrated by showing how things don't need to be that simple and then maybe uh, and I'm going to need your help because as I said from the beginning I'm not really a category theorist but I think it will be fairly clear that in the progression of ideas in this storytelling it is the ideas are categorical it makes sense it calls category theory forth um, um, okay so the first model is a um, a model where we have a graph and we have um, uh, the graph is popular the nodes in the graph are, are conceive them as some sort of idealized neurons. Again, this is a mega toy model, right? So it doesn't correspond to actual reality. Um, the interesting thing about this model is this thing right here, uh, which is that um, these, these uh, edges, um, directed edges, are, uh, are weighted. They have, well, they have a probability associated with them, and that it's the receiving, I'll call it neuron, although again, <coughs> just no, right? There's no claim here that there's any reality to this. Um, sets that, so it depends on J, not I. Um, also, uh, there's a random variable uh, which makes some of the connections have a positive weight, some of the connections have a negative weight, right? So, and the negative weighted ones um, can be scaled with some parameter K. So this is to, uh, to, to model uh, uh, inhibitory connections <coughs> with some probability Q. Uh, that's fixed in this class of models. Okay. And so we're looking to uh, talk about the uh, state of, you know, the, the state of the system configuration is whether which of the nodes are on or off. So there's some sort of, you know, binary uh, 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 variable associated with each node. Um, it could be more complicated than this, but I'm just, you know, describing it. It's already very complicated, I think. Uh, so the probability that a particular node is turned on um, is, a, 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 you know entails some sort of sum of inputs um, crossing a certain threshold. And we can make this a model of this kind even more, more specific. We can, uh, you know, we can have some sort of activation potential using some sort of monotonic function that activates it. That switched symbols here. I used to call it eta. Now it's a sigma. I'm Greek. I like to showcase Greek letters. So. And this is from different uh, you know, versions of the model, so it's okay. Um, and you get something, you know, probabilistic, because you know, obviously I, being a probabilist, I like to bring those uh, elements out. So you get some nice sort of, you know, multi-nomial uh, uh, distribution where various things can happen. There are channels. One channel is just the channel of the, uh, the excitatory signals that make it through a particular node, and they're all, all the nodes receive some. And, and then there's channels that are inhibitory, and then there are the channels that are blocked. And they're all random, right? There's randomness, uh, some associated locally with the receiving um, um, neurons, and some globally set in terms of uh, whether they are inhibitory or not. Okay, and then of course you have to aggregate, and you have to uh, consider what if you have a certain number, like condition on the number of activated uh, signals, so basically what's the activation potential that a particular neuron receives, then you, uh, you integrate that, and um, essentially you want to come up with what is, and this is the important thing, I mean, I could have, so this is one element of category theory, I could have just told you the whole story here, 
simplifying a little bit, but is going from the rows, the, if you remember uh, from two slides ago, row is the, the variable that each receiving neuron sets to the probability of whether its input will be, uh, the input, certain, you know, one of the inputs will be listened to or not, to the P's, which are the activation probabilities. Right? So there's a mapping between the two. And then, um, I mean, there's, there's some nice graphs in terms of like, here's, you know, you get some uh, oscillatory behavior in terms of the um, amount of activation as a function of, um, so this is the amount of activation for a particular neuron as a function of AH is the activation potential that it receives. And this is for, you know, 50 neurons. And, and when it's set, it's listening probability of 4.3. This is the sensitivity that it has. And so on. And you can graph it in different ways. So this is the kinds of stuff that I, you know, I and colleagues of mine would do with models like this, right? Understand what each neuron, the, the response, the black box that is the individual neuron under this model. And then you want to kind of create the model for the whole network, right? We want to, as I said, we have the whole network is made up of a collection of these row parameters that are the control parameters that each neuron has in terms of how well it listens to give you the activation probabilities. And we want to be able to, in other words, Convolve in a in a generic sense, you know what each neuron does. It's not really linear, okay? so it's not actual convolution, but just so you get the sense, uh, you know, from 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 the rows to p and back, right? And so we do some standard, you know, Fourier transform type work to do that. And um, I mean, I'm skipping through this on purpose because the point is to show you how this would be in a symbolic manner done very, you know. And there's a lot of superficial complexity, although it's very standard uh, you know, in, in many ways. Um, and you get, uh, in the end, you get an equation that looks like this one right here. Uh, this is a particular one, but uh, it, it's, a, it's a consistency equation. In other words, you have uh, a certain requirement V, in this case, on the right-hand side, is the initial state of activation, which neurons are on and which are off. Uh, on the left-hand side, P is the vector that shows the current activation state, you know, at every point in time of the neuron, of which neurons are on and off, uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and then uh, a V tilde that is a, is a matrix that encodes in some way through this convolution operator, type operator all the rows from everywhere. Um, um, IN is just basically a, a appropriately uh, scale, it, it, it's a basis transformation basically, um, and, and, and so is D. So effectively you get a matrix equation, you get some consistency equation that says given an initial state and given a particular set of rows, these are all the possible activation states you could have. You know, among the exponentially many that could exist, these are the only ones that are possible for, for, you know, for this particular set of rows. Okay, so that's one equation. And now we're going to go to the second equation because what do we want to do with it? What is this network trying to do? Right? Um, I mean, otherwise we could just set the rows to be whatever you want. But the idea was to, to uh, follow, and this again demonstrates in a very simple and you know, somewhat naive way, um, the, the general principle of um, you know, global optimization over a, 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 a free energy landscape, uh, a la Carl Friston, for example, so, in terms of, as an organizing principle for choices that, you know, architectural choices that uh, your own network would make. This is a particular very simple, as I say, toy example, almost like naively so, um, is a, is a, a maximum criterion. Basically, you're, you're trying to, given a particular initial state, you are uh, to choose the rows in such a way that you maximize the lowest probability of activation anyway. Right? I mean, obviously, it's explicitly non-complex, so that's the point. But otherwise, it's quite straightforward. Um, and uh, it turns out, again, lots of math, you know, taking derivatives, trying to solve systems of nonlinear equations. Um, and, uh, you know, you can be clever with algebra. Um, the point, uh, I think, yeah, the point is that that equation, the sort of cons the, uh, the first equation, which is a, a kind of the dynamics or the, the characterization of the um, uh, of the optimality condition in this case, uh, involves that first term, which is in fact a scalar uh, in this model. So this was part of the algebraic sort of cleverness of the thing, but you can get a, a, a scalar uh, 
which is, and this scalar of course involves, well, you can see here, it's a pretty huge scalar, um, but it's a scalar that involves um, all the rows, the rows are inside of the Fs, the Fs were the response to that black box that each neuron had, so the rows are here, and in fact they're partial derivatives with the row, those are all known, um, so it's some sort of big mess in terms of all the rows, and, and you see the Ps are all taken out here and over here. And so th that is a scalar. And the point is that this scalar will have to be zero in order for the automatic condition to be satisfied. And if it is, then it is satisfied for all of the neurons. There are ways to make the particular, one particular neuron to be optimal, but not the others. And that would come from this, 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 this is a, a column of the inverse matrix. So you, you do an inversion of a particular matrix and you pick the J column and then you can choose which role of that you can set that to be, you know, to be a particular neuron that's optimal. But the point is that you can choose one thing to set to zero and they would all be optimal. You, you know, you can solve one. So basically, think of what's the point here is we have two equations. This last one here as the consistency equation and this sort of automatic condition. Two matrix equations for how this, you know, type of model would work, it would try to solve this particular thing, it would reorient itself, it would sort of strategize what the best rows are, how much should each neuron listen, given what it knows about the, the average behavior of the rest of the, of the network. And, and you get some nice graphs, but anyway, this is one, model number one, okay? In a somewhat similar way, I'll show you now model number two. It's important that, that you understand I'm trying to make them be very general, and at the same time, I'm not trying to hide the fact that they're complex, right? It's a particular demonstration of what we know what uh, this type of work often entails when not using category theory. Um, so this is uh, another class of models. These are, uh, they're very distinct, and different people work with them, and uh, even though some of the machinery, I couldn't help, I mean, I wanted to make them as different looking as possible, but um, so these are were basically called random Boolean network type of models for, uh, for neural architecture. Again, very tall model, nobody claims this is actually what's going on. We want to figure out what general principles we can get from this class of stochastic interaction models and then try to see if uh, data from the connector might, might match. But my interest isn't on that end, on the empirical end. My interest is in just understanding the general principles here. So we have also a graph. Um, and we have connections, directed connections. And the thing here is that um, each, um, each arc, in fact, each connection, each, um, I should say, each pair or, or it, well, okay. At each node, uh, what you have is a Boolean function um, that um, combines the inputs in a particular way. So you randomize the Boolean function given however many inputs you have and you randomize which connections are there. So you start with some sort of, you know, Ehlers-Renyi graph or something like that, or you can generate whatever graph you want, but usually a small graph, let's say, like this, and you grow it in a very systematic way, for example, randomly, to begin with, and then you assign individual Boolean functions to each one, to each location. So um, something like this. Um, so for example, here's a particular uh, graph up here, and here's like a, the table of the Boolean functions that you associate to each node. Um, and here I've even started to write some of them as logical expressions, right? So uh, the next state, for example, of neuron one, again, these are, bully, these are uh, <coughs> binary, right? So the, whether it's on or off, uh, will be a sort of or between um, location two and four, and so on, right? Okay, so you get something like this. It looks like, for those of you that are into that sort of thing, like a satisfiability type of problem. Uh, I think I might refer to that a little later. But um, you get cycles, which is the reason why models like this are studied, and the reason why they're studied also specifically in the context of the brain, because they want to classify the periods of the, you know, these attractors, and so you get cycles like this. Um, so it's a discrete dynamical system, uh, stochastic discrete dynamical system. Um, and you get results of this case. So people want to understand, for example, the number of attractors that a randomly generated instance of this ensemble might have that has length L, right? And you can prove some asymptotics for this sort of thing. Um, and you can prove, uh, this is a, a nice, nice result that uh, shows that despite appearances, uh, the dependence 
on, um, on K and M can split. Uh, K is the length, this is, or rather, L is the length, K is the number, so this would be what's the probability of a network having, um, a network with N nodes having K attractors of length L, right? And this is a nice, especially for large, as N increases, this separation, the dependence on K and M gets better and better. So anyway, there are nice, you know, probabilistic results along these lines. You even get things that involve summing those random variables. Like if you don't care about, and I won't for what I'm going to talk about after, um, the length of the attractors, you just want to have several attractors, right? These models, if they're used as, as they often are, as models of essentially like memory or proto concepts, if you will, like that they can classify different things. They have to have more than one attractor, ideally several. The more you have, in some sense, the more things you can encode. They have to have large enough attraction zones, though, and they have to have various robustness properties, which go beyond what I'm going to talk. It's already complex enough. I didn't want to you know, add that layer. But the layer of complexity that comes from this seeking of robustness and the intertwining of the regions of attraction is very interesting and also categorical, I believe. But, um, but not much work has been done there. Anyway, you, get, you can get nice, sort of large deviation type results um, having to do with you know, how likely you get for a large N, they get tighter, um, you, how likely you have more than a certain or upper bounds. Uh, some people, including myself, uh, a while back, uh, did some work on um, lower bounds as well with this, but anyway. Um, so <laughs> here's a question that drives it in this case, right? Like, what, so what we're trying to do, uh, we are trying to design these or show how likely they are to arise spontaneously, for example, um, that, that, that have, in some sense, the highest complexity, that, that they can, and, and I mean complexity, I'm being vague, I mean it in a particular sense. You, you, um, I think the simplest way to describe it is the total number of, um, of attractors. And what do I have in mind is the following. Imagine we have um, 10 neurons, for argument's sake, right? Um, is it better to do a 10 neuron random model of this kind, or is it better to have two five neuron ones? Right? They each have a certain distribution of random number of, attra of attractors, and therefore constant, you know, sort of carrying capacity, if you will. But if you have two, right, and if they're separate, uh, you know, you could have um, the product of the number of attractors. You can have this one being in state like A out of three, and this other one in B in state five out of seven, let's say, so you get the product of it. So you have four minutes before you go to the question. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will jump ahead and, and show just a couple of uh, elements of what a, 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 a kind of a categorical type of symbolic dynamic model it is in this case. So we abstract it away from the specific instances of, what, so we, we're thinking of the sum and the morphism on the space of let's say, in this case, binary sequences, or it could be, you know, other, more, they could be, uh, they could be um, you know, more, more um, decorations on the individual elements, they could have more properties, but, uh, but for now, just to, it will suffice, so you have an endomorphism in that space, and then you study properties of that endomorphism, I'm just showing, I'm going to skip through, because these are some specific representations, but you get things like, you know, it feeds that endomorphism that, that propagates the, and in fact, the propagation uh, sorry, uh, where is it? Yeah, here. The, so you have a state, uh, let's, here I'm calling it G, and you're propagating it by acting on itself, and the action involves the mapping of phi. Phi tells it what to do on itself, and it keeps, it keeps propagating that way. And, uh, um, and you know, so I'm demonstrating here a particular example that I've skipped, so don't worry about it. This is a particular instance of that general principle. <coughs> and you can prove properties, like whether when is it a homomorphism? What properties does a commutator have? You know, so algebraic, abstract. So you know, you've embedded the two, both of these very different models that I described until now can be described in this abstract algebraic dynamic way. And the questions that you cared about can be represented in terms of questions about the properties of these, um, the, uh, these mappings, right? The, the, the endomorphism that um, propagates them. And in particular, what do you get? You get results like this. And I'm going to just, so. I'm going to skip through some slides, but basically you get results where there's always there's a parameter, what that parameter alpha, I call it here, what that parameter um, uh, means depends on the model at hand. For example, it often means some sort of balance between local versus global interactions, like in the original, in the first model. Um, 
it's it's some measure of the of the um, aggregate of, of the activation potential averaged over all of the network. So the local activation potential but averaged out over the whole the uh, network. In the second model, it has to do with um, your tendency to connect to to connect. Like once you have a, a, a network of size k, let's say, do you grow one more? You know, do you grow to k plus one, or do you start another one? Right. The, your tendency to you know, what, when is it better to do the latter rather than the former? And, uh, and you get basically different regimes. I'm showing three. Sometimes you're going to get two, but um, you get three regimes that have dynamically different behaviors. You get those generic people because of the symbolic dynamics. Um, so one aspect of it is you get, uh, in, uh, in one regime, you get, um, um, and, and so one of the things that we study here are the uh, Betty numbers of the, of the resulting graphs. Um, and also the invariant distributions at the end. Um, but you get you know, nice convergence for the betting numbers, um, and whereas in, in another regime you get frustrated betting numbers that don't converge. Um, and so we have this sort of classification that's good to, you know, the, 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 this, uh, there's also a question of ergodicity, I think in the first graph, that graph was the graph of the spectral gap, which is what probabilists care about, which is basically the idea of convergence rate, right? How quickly you converge and also whether you converge uniquely. So I wanted to end by, um, while I put this slide, this is my last slide, but rather than talk about this, I'm going to tell you um, two um, related um, thoughts that I had to kind of wrap up my, my storytelling, if you will. Um, so the first one is, I was reminded of uh, what uh, the novelist Milan Kundera used to say, in thinking about existential mathematics, so in his perspective, like what it means to feel about mathematics. And he said that slowness is memory, whereas speed is forgetting. Right? And that resonated with me in this instance because when you, you know, as your spectral gap was reduced uh, in probabilistically speaking, that means the convergence gets slower and eventually you get effectively non-ergodic processes. In other words, where the, 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 there's historical contingency. You can't, you, know, you don't forget where you start. You don't forget particular places where the process branched off. And in the end, they're you know, non-unique invariant distributions. So in the long run, you, know, you, you have memory, right? Um, that made me think that how could we possibly have consciousness without a sense of self? And the sense of self will come from memory. This was also a property of these systems. In other words, both of the systems, and I didn't have time to go into the detail, but both of these systems entail a breaking of symmetry because you start with symmetric rules, but all the instances are asymmetric. In other words, in the limit, they break apart and they become, for example, in the first class of models, you have some neurons that are directly connected to a particular starting neuron, and then others are not connected, but are connect, they observe, they don't observe it, although they had a chance to, but they lower their resulting rows towards it, and they observe the others that are observing it. So they're forming a model of the subset that is observing them, that, that is observing the original neuron, where the initial activation started. If you start the V on the left hand side, on the right hand side, with that way. Um, so there is an emergent sense of like observing part, you know, one part of the systems breaking up and observing another part of the system doing the thing, and that being optimal under you know, quite broad conditions. So there's three minutes left, including questions. Okay, and last thing, last thing I'm going to say is, yesterday, I spent the afternoon, maybe some of you noticed, and I can tell you more about that, because he told me to talk to you about it. I spent the afternoon with uh, Julian Barbour, who some of you might know uh, is a physicist here at, at Oxford, uh, and I made a point of wanting to, to see him. And uh, he, you know, believe, he obviously he, he's known for believing uh, that time is an illusion, right? And, and, and we were talking about time being an illusion. Um, and I brought that up and said, oh, you know, it's a persistent illusion, like Einstein said. He said, Einstein, the biggest mistake he made was that he didn't continue to make his theory fully relational. And he said, the time disappears. He said, time is complexity. And complexity arises through relational means. And once you do it fully relationally, you don't need time. Time is just an artifact, a perception of the relations. I said, you know, this is entirely categorical. I'm talking tomorrow about that. So he said, okay, you can put it in. So, um, but, but the, the idea is that 
I used to, I do still see this model, this, this way of thinking, as a time arising, or the perception of time arising through a, a process of non ergodicity, an, an endogenously non ergodic process, right? Uh, like, in other words, as a process, as a dynamical system, you're trying to do something, and in so doing, you're basically losing ergodicity and therefore, you know, creating, establishing a sense of time. This is epistemic at this point. I don't know to what extent it is, I have no proof of this, but. I think it's a good way of thinking about it. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. We have time for one question, and Ted, you can choose who you'd like to take. Okay. If there are questions. Does anyone have a question? Thank you. Yes. That's, yeah. okay. Do you, know you, you can come up and also hook up the thing yeah. while you're on. Okay, you're talking next. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know about oh, the like, critical brain hypothesis? Like, can you relate? Yes, the, yes. Yeah. And I was talking here about criticality, yes. Um, there, there is some work, although I didn't show it, I skipped through that, um, where the resulting dynamics, so it's to do with the robustness that I said, where basically the regions of attraction um, become so intertwined under certain conditions, so basically they're like fractal. So you can't, you know, so it, it feels like that is conjectural at this point, but that the, that the dynamics are driving it, that the optimization dynamics that you're trying to optimize this fairly benign thing, but in this complex setting, that it's driving you to that edge of criticality where basically you can't tell the difference between, let's say, two, the way I would think about it is between two proto concepts, like you can, you know, what is going to drive you to one or to the other? Yeah, that's very interesting. Unfortunately, please go to the